This is uh, our next uh, talk in the geospatial track. We're pleased to have Carlos from Maxar uh, and continue kind of the machine learning and using Apache tools on machine learning on big imagery. Maxar's got you know big imagery. So yep. Carlos, please give us your talk. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Uh, so good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, you know, whatever the time may be where you are. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Carlos Casares. Uh, I'm a data scientist at Matsar, where we're working with uh, deep learning solutions to you know big, big data in terms of uh, satellite imagery. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the initial work that we've been doing in terms of uh, doing auto retraining, so basically training models, but also how to incorporate feedback and how to uh, incorporate in ingest data through time, right? How to do this in an automated way by using some of the Apache uh, tools. So um, first let's go through like uh, the agenda very fast and some of the objectives of this talk. So we're gonna first uh, look at a very quick two slide introduction into image-based deep learning and specifically thinking about some of the challenges with deep learning and as it applies to satellite imagery specifically. From then we're gonna look at uh, how these challenges take us to the motivation for this work specifically, and uh, the tests that we've done in order to kind of um, piece out how reliable these approaches are in terms of uh, improving performance in satellite imagery object de detection, right? Um, right where the task is that we wanna we wanna be as um, as correct as possible. We wanna have the best performance. Uh, from then, uh, we're gonna take another turn and look at automation methods that uh, are used by by my team in, in the last few months in order to try to do make as much of this automated as possible, right? Because the, as you will see, the pipelines that end, end up happening uh, can be complex and they can be very time consuming. So you wanna do as much of it in a hands-off approach uh, as possible, right? Uh, so. I guess, again, it's just to like frame our talk for the next uh, half an hour or so. We're gonna start out by looking at an initial approach to uh, retraining of models and how these approaches get us some uh, improvement in terms of performance. And then we're gonna look at uh, the framework in which we might do this. And this framework should be able to, um, this framework should be able to support not only automation, but also being able to track performance over time, right? So if we are training models continuously and improving on those models, we wanna be able to uh, support tracking of the performance and the parameters and all the aspects that went into, all the parameters and aspects and hyperparameters that went into a specific model. So that down the road somewhere, if uh, we have a detection, if we have some results that are of interest, we can always go back and figure out uh, the piece of information right that went into into making that possible. Okay, so diving uh, head on into image-based deep learning, right? That's a quick introduction. Um, as you all might know or might not know, uh, image-based deep learning has been you know uh, a revolution since maybe the early 2010s, 2012, around there with the image competition. Um, image-based deep learning has uh, exploded. It's been used in a lot of different fields for a lot of different problems. Uh, some of the obvious problems to use to use it for are cases of classification, right? So, for instance, an image an image such as this that you have here, you might ask the question of, well, is this an image of a you know a bird or a cat or a dog? Um, then moving on to the object detection realm, now you're talking about localization problems, right? Um, can I find the thing that I'm interested in in an image? And given that I found it, can I perhaps count how many of them are there and are present, right? Uh, in the segmentation realm of object detection, you're looking at segmenting whole instances of tasks of, of objects. So given an image, you know, can I extract out the, the person or the or the car or um, whatever other object you might have? Now, in order to do this 
uh, since in the last few years, right, since this revolution uh, started, there's been a lot of models that have been developed, like the yellow type models, SSDs and red nets, right? These models perform um, their tasks very well. Um, now, when I say model, right, taking a, taking a quick step back, when I say model, there's nothing, you know, magical going on here. Uh, black uh, deep learning models are often thought to be black boxes, but in reality, there is just a collection of matrix operations over an, over an image, right? What are the ultimate, uh, what are the ultimate goal is to try to extract out some, some context information around pixels and from then make some decision about what is what is the thing that you're looking at in this image, right? Kind of like a person would do, but trying to uh, train uh, an algorithm to do that. Now, when I say train, that is basically done by feeding these models uh, pair input, right, of your input image, the image that you might be looking at, and some labels. In the case of classification, uh, the labels might be, you know, is it a, like the cat, dog, bird kind of label, just class names. In the sense of object detection, you might get labels that are, you know, a series of numbers that correspond to uh, coordinates, which, you know, show a box. In segmentation, the labels might be, uh, now you're talking about a mask where each pixel has a probability of uh, being a certain class or not. And as I mentioned, these models tend to perform very well right over natural scenes and natural scenes being our normal point of view, right? We're looking horizontally into the horizon, um, classes that, that we're familiar with every day, like people, cars, animals. They perform very well in, this, in these kinds of images, uh, which of course has led to these kinds of models being used in many other realms, one of them being satellite imagery. Now, moving into the satellite image realm, you can, ask the same kinds of questions. You might ask uh, in the classification sense, right? Like if I look at a, at a piece of an image, like the one here in the in the lower left, uh, what are what am I looking at? What are the pixels representing? Is this, uh, what is the land use basically, right? Is this some grassy area or is this uh, maybe a city or is this some uh, roads? Likewise in the object detection uh, realm, you are looking at can I extract that whole instances of things? So maybe you're looking for cars, right? Maybe you're trying to count how many cars there are in the roads. Uh, for instance, specifically, Matter has recently done some tasks where we're trying to count cars, um, specifically in this time of COVID, in order to see how people are um, how people are adhering to the you know the stay at home orders, the don't go out if, unless you need to kind of uh, kind of mandate um, these subject detection models. Are, are very handy in that, right? By doing car counting over public areas, you can start to answer some of these questions. Uh, you can also ask some invitation question in, based on satellite imagery. Given, a, given an image, maybe you want to extract that all the roads, right? Or all the railroads. Uh, this might be done in order to right, uh, update your maps on a continual basis. Um, now, having moved into this realm, though, everything is in, uh, doesn't just work right off, right off the box, right? Uh, we have some challenges, some issues with this transition. For instance, one, uh, there's definitely a different point of view, right? Uh, as it's shown in the picture right here, uh, cars, boats, airplanes, they look very different from, from up high. Now, of course, you can just um, tag these instances in a lot of images. Since um, since this is not the everyday data, this is not the data that perhaps universities uh, used for a lot of their challenges and a lot of their research. It requires a lot of time to go through and tag the data, right? Not only that, but the all of a sudden, you your orientation of your objects kind of take any form. Uh, also, the scale of objects, right, is way different. Now you're looking at very small objects in very large images as opposed to the images of cars here, for instance, where the car takes in a, a big chunk of the image. Uh, so not only that, but there's there's many more challenges, right? Uh, speaking farther, I guess the, ch the, the challenge of scale and size of the objects, when you move from natural scenes in, to overhead imagery, uh, there's also an, an image, uh, uh, the problem of 
the scale of the objects, right? Uh, that are much more buried. For instance, you may, uh, you guys may be familiar with the model YOLO, you only look once, it's very popular nowadays, and it's able to detect a number of different objects within the single model. So you run a single model and you can able, you're able to get um, detections over many different classes in, in these natural scenes. However, moving into the overhead realm, these techniques don't really work as well because now you're dealing with objects of interest that are very buried in size, right? A car, for instance, in an overhead image might only be uh, a dozen pixels in width and length, right? Um, whereas uh, the the stadium of example here might be much, it's, it's much, much larger than that, right? So the models struggle to find uh, objects of such different scale. Uh, likewise, you also deal with problems of data set bias, right? And these are, these are problems inherent to really aid any um, machine learning task where data is involved, but it shows up specifically in uh, object detection in satellite imagery because when you're doing tagging uh, of objects, because it's very expensive, it's very hard to tag over the whole distribution of your data that you are interested in. Imagine, for instance, tagging um, an object of interest in, in a warm climate, right, where it's uh, lots of trees, lots of trees, and uh, maybe not much snow, and then trying to deploy that model in an area where perhaps it snows a lot, or perhaps uh, it's a desert scene. So the underlying distribution of your data is now different. And the, so the base assumption that your model is uh, that your base, that your model is going to perform well in this new in this new region kind of falls apart uh, so it becomes another tagging problem right now you have to go and tag instances in those areas uh, not to mention that data set bias can also come just from the fact that you might have low sampling opportunities right let's say you did want to go and tag uh, cars in that desert region well perhaps there aren't that many uh, cars that drive through those areas so just the uh, sampling opportunities are increased. Uh, and even taking a step back, right, from, from the model training specifically, um, and looking at the larger life cycle of deep learning, right, we are also facing with, we're also faced with a, an engineering problem. Given that training the model is only one piece of it, uh, if we look at the other parts of the pipeline, for instance, getting the, uh, um, making it, putting it into a form that is, uh, can be ingested by the model, doing inferencing in the end, and it's like scoring these models, doing this continuously over many different object types and many different uh, regions can be quite an engineering problem, especially when you consider that uh, these models are not at all meant to take in large swaths of images, right? Uh, satellite images can be, you know, can be very large in the in the realm of gigabytes, whereas these models are more meant to take in small chunks of images, right, in the, in the scale of uh, hundreds of pixels. So being able to do this reliably, right, where you can take an image, ship it into a way that can be ingested by the model in order to train, and then in the back end, uh, cut it up again so that it can be inferenced by the model. And not only that, right, because inferencing will give you results in pixel space, which then need to be converted into geospatial coordinates, and then all need to be appended together in order to have a full result set for any given image. Uh, this all creates quite an engineering challenge, right? Uh, I guess luckily, uh, Matter has been doing this for a number of years, so they have a, a pretty complete set of tools and they're a deep core set of tools that, uh, that do a lot of this and make at least this part of the processing a lot easier, right? But, um, but that's not to say that the problem isn't, isn't there, isn't present and doesn't require a lot of um, a lot of a lot of thought to go into it. So having looked at some of these motivation, uh, some of these challenges, um, the motivation for this particular work is to try to allevi alleviate some of these issues, and especially alleviate these issues as you continuously try to integrate new data into the process. So first of all, we want to be uh, we want to position ourselves right in a place where we can use the latest state of the art. Uh, now this is the state of the art both in terms of the research and in terms of tools. Uh, as far as the research goes, right, there's uh, many, many groups all over the world working on this 
um, object detection problems, doing things like uh, active learning methods, hyper grammar tuning methods, neural architecture search methods, all trying to improve performance over um, over a given model, right? Uh, in the terms of tools, um, there's many there's many companies and organizations putting out tools for automation, putting out tools that allow abstraction of the details of um, of training particular models, right? Allowing the user to be able to concentrate on the tougher problems. Um, it's specifically this, for instance, that we are interested in, right? If if we can come up with some automation methods to allow non-machine learning experts to tackle some of these easier um, object detection tasks, then perhaps we will allow the the machine learning experts in our, in our ranks to tackle some of these more problems that have been plaguing us, right? Uh, so our second motivation, given that we're trying to be as efficient as possible in terms of um, using the state of the art, our second motivation is then to start tackling just the staggering amount of data that is out there, right? Um, for instance, take, take a satellite, uh, a mat, one of the master satellites, right? Which can collect over uh, 3 million square kilometers of, of images every single day. Uh, so to put this into context, that's basically imaging the whole of the United States every three to four days. Now that is, that's a lot of images, right? And if you're trying to do, for instance, car counting over such a big area, um, you're going to need a lot of resources and you're going to need a lot of uh, thought into how you engineering, engineer the pipeline in order to do this effectively. Uh, not only that, right, but these satellites, Earth observation satellites specifically, uh, continue to go up and they, they've been, uh, as the plot here shows, right, there's plans for more and more to go up in the next few years. So the amount of data that is available and that uh, we should be able to use in order to give the best results to our customer in order to create the best models, it's only going to keep increasing. Uh, it's also important to realize, specifically in the realm of retraining of models and automating the, the feedback process, that this new data doesn't only come from external sources, right? It doesn't only come from external images, but instead uh, the models themselves, the models that we've already built can give us also new uh, the information that we can incorporate. For instance, let's say you have a model and you use it to test over some area, the, the correct and mistaken predictions of that model can be used as new data to fit into the next generations of the model. Right. And it is through this approach that we are starting, that we're trying to tackle some of these active learning methods and also tackle the biases within the models that we've already created, right? In order to try to improve them and uh, be able to use them more broadly in different, re different regions around the world. So um, the test, uh, the approach that we are kind of taking in order to, to try to do this retraining, retraining process is as follows. Um, we'll, we want to take a model and um, you, let me take a step back. So there's, there's lots of approaches that you might be, that you might use to do this. Uh, retraining, ROML, there's a, you know, these are hard words out there right now. One thing you may do, for instance, is curriculum learning, right? Where you basically take, uh, you basically take the examples at any given time that you might fit into your model and you sort them, you, you link them by easiest to hardest, right? The idea being that a model, much like a person, should learn uh, on a curricular, on a curriculum of easiest to hardest. Um, or you might do the exact opposite, right, and do uh, online hard sample mining, where now you're trying to fit your model the hardest examples at any given time. The idea being that if your model learns to uh, learns by seeing these examples more and more, then it will get better at those. And since it's getting better at the hard cases, it should also be uh, better in the easy cases, right? So there's a number of other approaches, but ultimately the issue with these approaches is, is that they try to uh, improve a single model a single model through its training process. And while the, these approaches perform great in, in that kind of definition, that is not our definition um, of retraining, right? We want to be able to train models, but also incorporate this new data that we, that, you know, that is provided by these images every single day. So instead of using those approaches, we look at doing um, 
a method of hardened sample mining over the whole over the whole pipeline of the model. So from the data collection to the training and the testing, we do the whole pipeline. Then at the very end, we use the inference results from the current model in order to get some of this feedback, feedback information that we then loop back and aggregate with new information coming in. Uh, this might be new images, right, or um, new annotations from, uh, from taggers. But we aggregate all this information and feed it into this next generation of training. We iterate over this uh, process of fitting in these this, uh, mistake annotations like, like you see here in the, in the image. We do this in loops as, for, as long as it takes, right? As long as it takes either to meet some performance criteria or as long as it takes for the model performance to converge to some, to some state of state level. Um, so, so far we have tested this approach with uh, two frameworks and two models, uh, two model architectures. The first one is uh, the TechNet used through uh, Rhythmic Cafe and used through the digits interface from NVIDIA. Now we started with this model type because at least when used through the NVIDIA uh, digits interface, it's very easy to use. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of setup and it's surprisingly good, it's surprisingly good um, for how easy it is to use, right? However, the architecture doesn't come without its uh, limitations. Again, specifically using the model through the digits interface, there's a lot of restrictions, right? On uh, custom using custom generators or using cost, uh, custom context classes, or maybe or even using class weights. It is some of these things that would make it possible to do things like curriculum learning and um, active feedback, right? Some of the, some of these techniques that might tackle this data type bias. Uh, on the other hand, so we also have tested this with uh, a YOLO type architecture rather than Keras. Uh, have been written in Keras, there's a lot more, there's a lot more options. There's a lot more uh, things that are feasible and, and doable with these models, right? For instance, you can do the curriculum style approaches by just feeding your model the right uh, instances, the right, uh, the right chips at the right time through, again, a custom generator, or you might do even fancier, more uh, newer approaches, right? Like hyperparameter tuning or neural architecture search. But now, like over every training, over every training um, round, you might be looking at for the best architecture, right? To prune off the things that are necessary and really look for the most efficient model, given your current data. Uh, so, in fact, so many things are possible, right? With Keras and even even now looking at uh, some PyTorch style models, right? That the each the issue becomes the opposite of of in the, the TechNet case where so many things are possible that it really becomes important to have a good understanding of what the state of the art is and what the best approaches are out there, right? Especially if, uh, like in our problem, right? There is, like I said, lots of data, lots of objects that we're interested in. Um, if you wanna use the best uh, techniques to find the best optimal performance for every model, uh, the options are almost unlimited. So given the real world, limitations of resources and time, uh, it is necessary when looking at uh, these uh, frameworks, right? These learning frameworks that allow for a lot more control, it's necessary to keep in mind what the best is in order to be able to uh, guide yourself better and only, uh, you know, and basically don't burn out your, your resources. So, hey, Carlos, you've got about 10 minutes left in the session. And so if you want to leave some time for Q&A, that'd be great. But your choice yeah. is just let you know. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'm thinking a little longer than I meant to. I'll speed up through the rest of this. Uh, so looking at some of the results here, for instance, for CAFE, um, right, we tested the approach that I was just talking about, where we train a model and then use it to um, use it to inference over some images. From then we get some feedback. Uh, the feedback is fed into uh, the next generation of the model. That generation also has a sibling model that we take as the controller, right, which doesn't get any feedback. Now the hypothesis is that by looking at this uh, feedback, the augmented model is gonna be able to outperform the controller. And the results 
seem to show that, right? So looking at these plots, they show that percent difference uh, from the feedback model to the to the uh, control model. So looking at the low range of the ad sizes, we see that as you add low number of annotations, right, the models perform up almost equally. And that's given by the almost equal variation in the positive and negative directions. And that makes sense, right, because your models are basically getting the same data set. However, as you start increasing the number of mistakes, the augmented model outperforms the control model pretty, uh, pretty extensively. So this is, again, just showing that our simple feedback approach actually does gain us something, right? The same thing can be said for this yellow architecture. Where here, um, a colleague did a test where basically she added uh, empty chips, right? Directed empty chips uh, guided at where the previous model had uh, had stumbled. And by adding different different amounts of these empty chips to the data set, her performance increased through these different iterations, right? So uh, having shown, having seen that uh, this kind of approach of automating loops of retraining can help us, let's go ahead and talk about uh, some automation real fast. Um, so we looked at two different approaches to do this, right? NiFi and Airflow. Uh, they're both different tools uh, for different purposes, but ultimately they kind of they kind of uh, intersect in their ability to like uh, process tasks, you know, as these tasks flow from one state into another, uh, which is exactly what we're doing right when we're kind of testing this pipeline of, of um, flows from getting data all the way to inferencing and scoring. That's also important, right, to, to consider that neither Nightfly nor Airflow have any built-in knowledge about data science pipeline or deep learning. So it's necessary to stack these tools on top of uh, another tool that has some knowledge about this. Uh, in our case, we use this built-in library uh, called Spot, which you know has a lot of this stuff built into it. So looking at NiFi real fast, um, NiFi is a very common tool. It's a very, it's a very popular tool, right, for data flow management. It strengthens in looking at uh, live flows, right. So in the terms of auto retraining and automating the the deep learning pipeline, it's extremely helpful in the sense of uh, given a model, can we ingest data? Can we ingest data to be inferenced over, and use it to um, maybe do some of this inferencing, but also notifications, right? Uh, not only that, but by using the data provenance tools that are built into NiFi, you know, we can, when we do get a prediction, we can have some uh, reliability and some confidence that we're able to, we'll be able to track back and look at our, um, at every aspect of the pipeline of the flow that touched the data and have some, have a better sense, have some better context for, for that detection, right? Um, so even though it, it fits a lot better in that kind of inference pipeline, if you wanted to do uh, training in NiFi, I found that this simple flow tends to work, for instance. Here, NiFi is acting as a as like a manager tool, right? Taking in this DAG, taking in these flows, which uh, these flow files, which are basically defining each part of the pipeline again, right? Like for instance, the flow here, uh, the flow file here defines an inference job and NiFi is writing this flow file into the underlying library, again, the uh, library that we're building in the house in order to have it, you know, check for dependencies and actually run the job in a, in a Dockerized container. Under five minutes, so you got about four minutes. Um, so, cool. so given the time, I think I'll skip a couple of these guys. Um, so uh, let's switch real quick to Airflow. Airflow is a somewhat different tool than the NiFi. Uh, in it, the user predefines a DAG, right? A directed acyclic graph and uh, runs over it at some cadence. Um, unlike NiFi, Airflow, I think, would much better fit operating over data that has already reached a central location. So, in the case of auto retraining, we might do something like this, right? Where we have a DAG defined to run at some cadence, in this case, daily, but if you like, you could do it weekly or bi-weekly or every 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 month, depending on your resources. Um, and the DAG might run through the whole learning process, from getting data all the way to uh, training the model, inferencing, and then doing some feedback. And again, you might have 
uh, different branches of this DAG in order to you know, test different uh, hypotheses, different hyperparameters, different preprocessing functions. At the end of every one of these uh, rounds, you might get the best model for, for any given uh, round, right? And of course, you can extend this even farther given resources. Um, you can, we've used this, uh, this kind of simple pipeline to scale over different objects. So for instance, in this case, we uh, have different DAGs over different object types, over different model architectures, and you can toggle in each one on and off uh, independently. Uh, I think I'll skip this. Something that's used that we found very useful is that the ability to task task specific task specifically allow you to do things like this, right? Where this is the timeline of the whole flow um, of a retraining round. And for instance, here it allows us to see that our second round of training um, took a lot, took about twice as long as the first round of training, right? Which is expected. So, uh, in summary, you know we've. Uh, We've, we've done a lot of automation here, but yeah, I'll let it there. Excellent, Carlos. Uh, yeah, uh, if there's some questions in chat, that'd yeah. be great. Um, I don't see any immediately. We've got about a minute or so to go. Okay. Um, yeah, but, and if you uh, feel free to reach out to me on Slack uh, or uh, I'll post my email in the chat if anybody has any questions afterwards. That'd be cool. Yeah, go ahead and you know, do that pretty quick because we're about ready to shut the session down. There is also a an Apache Con Slack channel. Um, okay. that, uh, folks can join. There, you can put it there. There's a geospatial. Um, is it a channel? I forget what the sub parts. So maybe it's a geospatial channel in the Apache Con sure. overall. Uh, so um, there is a question. Are you regularly using one or the other now, Airflow or NiFi or both? Which and when? Yeah, so we're using both at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, we're using NiFi more for kind of the inference pipeline, where you know it's reaching out to endpoints for for images, and it's reaching out to endpoints where people might drop in images that they're interested in uh, inferencing over, and those are getting um, passed through the model, and then notifications are being sent out to to different customers. And we're using Airflow to manage more of the training the training rounds, uh, where which is a data sitting in the database and images sitting in some repository and uh, we want to train them in some cadence, right? Like every few days, train the car detector again. Every few days, train the airplane detector again. Cool. Well, let's leave it there. Again, Carlos, thank you very much. A lot of creative yeah. ideas and uh, let's keep the conversation going. Uh, we'll now switch over to another channel. So yes, click yes. on sessions and go join the next session right, in the geospatial track. Thanks a lot.